The time having arrived, I call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order, and I ask you to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. Could I ask you to please remain standing for a moment? Uh, we've lost two members of the Brockton Public Schools family this week. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Gormley first and then the superintendent. Uh, this past week, um, we lost a member of the Huntington and Gilmore family, Esther Montero, who was a para professional, uh, and also the parent of two BPS employees, uh, Jerison Montero, who was a teacher, uh, SEI history teacher at the high school, and his sister, Cynthia Montero, who is an MTA at the Plough. Uh, she's a longtime member of the uh, BPS, and um, her husband is also an educator. And he's the pastor of Nova Volunteer Church. So they're really great members of the community, um, and we're very sad by our loss. Superintendent. Sorry, that loss, and also uh, many of you knew Harold McDonald, a retired principal uh, in the Brockton Public Schools. I certainly had the privilege of working alongside him as a teacher and a school adjustment counselor many years ago. He was a wonderful leader uh, and certainly spent a lot of years educating our children, supporting our teachers and our families. So I would ask you also, I remember Harold McDonald in this moment of silence. So if we could please observe a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Okay, we normally open with hearing of visitors. Tonight, uh, no one signed in uh, to be heard as a visitor. So we'll move right on to our consent agenda. The consent agenda is a block of uh, relatively routine school committee business that the committee considers as one uh, in order to keep the move, meeting moving along. Uh, however, any individual uh, member of the committee may request that any item in the consent agenda be pulled out for individual deliberation. So with that in mind, are there uh, any members of the committee that would like to be recognized to withdraw items from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I'll accept a motion on the consent agenda in its entirety. Motion to approve the consent agenda in its entirety. Yeah. Motion made, properly seconded by Ms. Plant. All in favor? Opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, at this point, uh, I will turn the meeting over to the Superintendent of Schools for her report on learning and teaching. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I actually do have two communication notes. Oh. And I, um, I, I think it was a meeting ago, I wanted to recognize a letter that was sent to our Athletic dire Director, Kevin Caro. And the letter states, uh, the other day as I was biking the Cape Cod uh, bike path, I encountered the Brockton High School cross-country teams. As I was born and raised in Brockton's Montello neighborhood, I always take the opportunity to interact with individuals from my hometown. This gentleman goes on to say that um, he had conversation with members of the cross-country team, and they represented the city of Brockton in a very positive manner. I spoke directly with several of the young people on the team. They were very polite and very enthusiastic about their team, their school, and their city. And it is signed uh, James Pinzino from Marlboro, Mass. So again, thank you to our members of the cross country team and their coach for representing our city well when they encounter, again, people that grew up in the city and are very proud of all that we have to offer. And my other favorite note was, uh, those of you present at the last school committee meeting, we all saw Joshua Osterberg, Jr., he tells me. And he, again, was the young man with his birthday money that gave it to the fund for, at the time, we thought it was one, two hurricanes. Since then, there's been three or four storms, and we continue to wrap that up at the, by the end of October. But he wrote, thank you for his wrestling figures. He loved them. My favorite part of this, he dates it. He signs his name. He actually has us giving him the little figurines. And also, these are the people in the audience. So I thought this was priceless. I think it's quite a lesson. And we can bet that Joshua over at the Brookfield School will share for a long time with his classmates, not only you know, being able to come to a school committee meeting, but you know, certainly able to be a wonderful example for the rest of us. So 
proud of those communications. And going into the report uh, of the superintendent uh, of schools, um, I also want to recognize, and I'm not sure if you can see this picture, probably not, but this is Marciano Stadium. And what was really terrific about this was this was Marciano Stadium on this past Friday evening, where we held, and we have done it previously, but not on a regular basis, and the camaraderie, the, the wonderful feelings of the evening. First of all, our football team beat Durfee uh, in the big three. That's very good for Brockton High, congratulations. Um, certainly our halftime show is second to none. It always is, our cheerleaders. But to see those stands filled, and we had teacher appreciation, staff appreciation. We had welcome back alumni. Um, it was just a wonderful homecoming, and so many families came out. And it really does make a difference to fill those stands, to get out there. You know, so many people came up and said, we have to continue to do this each year. So I commit that next year we'll make it even bigger and we'll welcome people back. And uh, there are so many people to thank. First of all, Dr. Cliff Murray for hosting us, uh, Tom Burke and his wonderful staff for feeding us, um, Deputy Superintendent Mike Thomas and Ken Thompson for putting things together, uh, Vinnie McCrean and Michelle Bolton, Jane Faroli, our alumni staff, Kevin Caro, our athletic director, Kevin DuPont for helping out. So many of our staff members that came, the alumni that came. Mayor, I know you had a moment to, to step in. Um, I enjoyed the evening. The weather was absolutely wonderful. And it was just a, a great opportunity for us to share, again, all that is wonderful uh, in our Brockton public school community. So thank you to everyone for making that a, a wonderful evening. The weather was perfect, too. It, it, was, it was absolutely beautiful. And I, I guess I, I would be remiss if I did not mention a BC tent and awning. And when you can call people up, and just say we're really looking for a donation, it's an evening to celebrate our staff, and in no time, you know, they sent over the large canopy that really signified the area where people could come and congregate. Um, just, just a lot happening that evening, so great evening. Um, I also want to report on, and I know we've been watching this very closely, but I want to caution everybody. So the state is looking at, is there going to be an influx in Massachusetts? And of course, we're looking at the Brockton districts of students that are escaping some of those areas that uh, had uh, catastrophic uh, weather, hurricanes, earthquakes, et cetera. So what we are seeing, and again, we're uh, documenting, and very few have shown up so far. We've had uh, two students arrive from Puerto Rico and two from the US Virgin Isles at this point. But this is not something that's going to happen overnight. So I am pleased that the state is looking at how we are registering students and we're making sure that we're designating where these students are coming from if they're areas that have been hit by these storms. Um, and they will make a decision not only on our October 1st reporting, which is important for us for funding for next year, but also what will the influx be this year. And while we are a district carefully watching our class sizes as we watched kindergarten come in, as we now are watching if there will be students entering our district, this is critical and I want to thank the state we continue to have dialogue with them, and I'll continue to report to you uh, on those areas. Um, as far as our enrollment update goes, I think it's important when we talk about, and, and just give me a little bit of room here to, to talk about this. When you look at our schools, I think it's important for you to hear the sheer number of some of the students in our schools. So the are known 733, and it was probably a school to maybe hold 800 students. Our um, Angelo School, 913 students. Hancock School, 658. Our George School, 927 students. The Raymond School, 915 students. The Brookfield, 654. The Downey School, 651. And you can almost tell the error these schools were built and the capacity that they were built for. Our most recent schools have some of the largest capacity. The Mary Baker, 823. The Davis School, 720, and right now I'm reporting K to five. The Gilmore School, which was our former uh, Huntington School, is 567, and the Kennedy School is 597. Going on to our middle schools, the Plouffe, one of our larger, 685 students. North, 633. West, 641. 
Ashfield, 507, which is larger than it's been. East, 482. The Davis, which is the middle school part, which is just 6, 7, and 8, 307. And South, 491. At Brockton High School, we presently have uh, 4,161 students, many other students in our pathway uh, programs. Total in our district presently is 17,057. And the reason I wanted you to see that as we continue to look at our enrollment is to look at some of the very large schools. And I remember coming on as superintendent, and one of the things I talked about, and we have not been able to do this, I remember looking at a school like the Davis, or let's pick the George, our large schools, and say, when you talk about equity, it doesn't always mean equal. In other words, we have one assistant principal no matter which elementary school it's at, and one principal. And we would have liked to have looked to staff our schools differently based on, and I wanted you to see the large numbers at some of our schools. So this is a discussion we continue to have. We keep uh, also at Central looking to really support all of those schools. And I also, while I'm talking about um, updates and enrollment, tomorrow we're trying something very different as a district. We are going out, our executive team, and you're talking everybody from the deputy, the superintendent, everybody that makes up our executive team. Tomorrow was one of our first school visits. We're going to the Kennedy School. And the idea of the visit is to spend some time talking about, again, our strategic initiatives, our goals, instructional excellence, safe and supportive schools, uh, community and family engagement, to talk again about the initiatives happening in the schools, to take a look at the facility. So you've got everybody there can look to look at what is happening. So when we come back and report, we'll be able to look at all our schools in a very similar manner and start to be able to, as we start to unveil next year's budget, we'll be able to not only go and see, is there room? Um, you'll hear me tonight talk about uh, the next part of looking at our staffing is our bilingual department. So, you know, this is what we're doing when we're out there. So let me go on to, I'm going to actually invite up um, Deputy Superintendent Thomas, uh, Ray Shirtliff, uh, and Kim Gibson, President of our Brockton Education Association. One of the things we've been doing, and many of you are familiar with our district capacity project, and I know Brett Gormley is actually serving as a school committee member. Lisa, I know you have been uh, on the committee, I know it's been difficult to attend based on some of the times of these meetings during work hours. But the reason I say that is because when you talk about a district capacity project, there are three prongs to it. And the idea behind the support from the Rennie Center has always been to bring management together, to bring school committee together, and to also bring our uh, Brockton Education Association together. And to work on a project, it develops strong labor relations, and it allows us to, again, work together to make something very positive happen for the district. So um, I'm not sure who's speaking first. Ray, uh, are you, uh, Kim Gibson, you're leading us we'll off. let the deputy say. superintendent kick off. Oh, Kim. one, two, yes. two. They're defaulting to me. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting us back to update you on the district capacity project. Um, we most recently met on October 3rd, and we have decided that we are going to try to do some um, parent outreach so we're in the middle of pr producing some um, activities for the parents to come out to and I have to say it's been um, very good to see the, the morale at the high school has um, really gotten to be very supportive of one another and I think that inviting the parents in is the next step in moving the high school forward. So I think Ray actually was going to um, give us a little bit of background on some of the stuff as well. Sure, yeah. Um, the, the task force um, actually got off the ground last March, as many of you know from your <coughs> previous updates. It was a code of conduct, culture uh, task force that focuses on a, a number of different issues. We've had long discussions over the past several months. Uh, we're looking at certain areas of the handbook that we want to focus on, uh, in, including um, cell phones, um, dress code in the third one is uh, the bullying bullying right and we've had uh, a number of discussions in that area and I think that following the superintendent's commitment we want to hear from parents and figure out ways of hearing from parents uh, through parent forums etc there's been a, a teacher survey that the district and the union worked on in June uh, there have been some discussions about a future student survey 
some really rich discussions and some presentations from, uh, from Ethan on that. And now we're focusing on uh, some parent outreach uh, to, to uh, be helpful to the high school in particular, if not the district, at some other point in time. And uh, we're, we're nearing some, some decisions about an event that may take place sometime in the future to kind of welcome parents and get to know parents at the high school as a starting point. And then from there, planning on parent forums to get some input and feedback on certain items within the handbook. Anything else? No, I think it's important to, um, sorry. The, the reason we want, obviously, the parent input is to, um, you know, we re really want to talk about, for example, cell phone use. Um, you know, parents want instant access, obviously, to their child when they're in school. Uh, and then also you need, obviously, teaching and learning going on. So, um, you know, we want to have that open dialogue with parents to discuss um, when cell phone use is appropriate in school um, and some of the pitfalls of when cell phone use is allowed in school and uh, when we have conflicts and issues with uh, bullying and um, bullying through social media and text messages, I think it's important to have that dialogue um, with parents about um, the benefits of cell phone use and I think teachers actually have a lot of good ideas where they use their cell phone in classrooms for uh, kids to do some real good things as far as teaching and learning goes, but also the pitfalls of cell phone use as far as social media, um, misuse, and also bullying. Um, and so that's one thing we want to focus on. I know that um, we want to have an open dialogue about also the dress code. Uh, people have questions of, um, you know, why do we not allow this or that um, in, in dialogue, because again, being the father of three young girls, it's, it's hard to go out there and shop sometimes for clothes that, you know, that people think are appropriate or not appropriate, so I think we have to have that open discussion as well. And also, when you get down to the lower levels, a lot of, you know, a few of our elementaries have gone to uniforms, so that might lead to discussing more of the option of uniforms or, or those kind of things. So I think it's important for us to have the parent forums so uh, we develop a code of conduct that is appropriate for each level, elementary, middle school, and high school. I think it's important, uh, Superintendent Thomas, when you mentioned being out there with parents, I was invited uh, last Thursday evening to go to the George School uh, PAC, and they had quite a few members there. I want to say they probably had at least 30 or 40 parents there, which is a big deal. And there are those are exactly the conversations that are happening at the elementary level, but to be able to put something together in an organized format and allow the parents again to have some discussions, you know, about how we run our schools or what you know what their expectations are, I think is critical in this process. And the thing that I'm also very pleased about is we are starting to open up our parent portals. So we have had the capacity to do that for a long time with our infinite campus but hadn't had the training. There were other initiatives that continued to come down. But as we try to, and I'm not sure we'll ever get ahead of technology, I know we won't, but at least we'll start to have those discussions, open up our parent portal, our student portal. I know this year we're getting down to the middle school level, hopefully to the elementary level. So these kinds of conversations, there'll be lots of ways to, to really reach parents. You know, we're texting now to get information to them, a lot of really positive feedback uh, with the texting from uh, the George School, anyway, the other evening. So um, I think opening up those forums, whether they're forms parents are filling out or whether you're actually going around and opening up dialogue throughout the district. I would, I would only add that I think some of you know that um, this labor management initiative, this work with the Brockton Education Association and the district is now in its fifth year. And uh, you're one of the few districts across the state that has maintained that initiative. And I think that it's pretty important. We have a monthly schedule. Uh, we're, we're tackling a, a several different issues and having some deep conversations. So I think that uh, while it's October, uh, there's several uh, months left ahead. And I think you're making good progress and having some difficult decisions. So Ray, when you bring up the agenda, and I'll never forget recently a kindergarten teacher telling me with the children it's like herding cats, you know, trying to get everybody when they're little. So I feel that is the way it is with us. So we're going in a million different directions, and thank goodness we've actually had some direction. Ray keeps us on task with an agenda that we actually populate. 
Um, I thank you for the flexibility because sometimes you know we are going in a million different directions. I think the commitment, I'm speaking certainly for management. Um, I know, Brett, you've tried to make it when you can, you know, and I know we continue to update our school committee and uh, have the support with this kind of a project. Kim and I have presented at a state level, and if anyone can get through what we've gotten through the past five years, I think we should take the, the show out on the road sometime, I mean, if we ever survive this. So I, I think that keeps the lines of communication open, um, not only in having a project that is meaningful, you know, the UNIDOS program, I just got a word last evening um, about a superintendent out of Taunton that received a $24,000 grant in bringing a number of superintendents with not only Portuguese speaking communities, but also that have very specific programs. And all I could think of was, you know, Brockton and, and the UNIDOS program and, and what we've really done in our district. And that was the result of a district capacity project that actually started with Dr. Malone before I was sitting in this seat. So um, I, I think it's really important that everybody hears that this kind of a project brings uh, some very good work to the district that supports our families and our community. Um, with the UNIDOS program, we hope to continue to open it up to our uh, Haitian Creole. Uh, that was our, our next step, and, and that is not something we'll continue to, to do that. But this, again, leads us in a direction, as you said, we've, we started meeting, I want to say, um, in the winter last year, February or March. March, yeah. right. So when you talk about you know, the input from faculty, we're talking about student input, you're already talking about parent input. It's, we've got a long way to go, but eventually we would like our handbooks to be very much user-friendly. So the parents, whether the child is a kindergartner to the high school, we all understand and have agreed upon what the protocol is, what the dress codes are, and obviously they could change at different levels on what's acceptable. Um, but I think, again, this is just another one of those opportunities, and I thank you for, for your support. There was a question. Ms. Blake. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for all the work that you have done. I do get the email updates, and I apologize that due to the time of the meetings, I wasn't able to be a part of this um, because the work you're doing is very important. Um, and I'm happy to hear you mention that you want to do a parent survey. My question would be, we want to reach a vast majority of our parents. Are you going to, are you looking into doing this in several languages and in several formats? We've had discussions generally around uh, surveys. Around student surveys is the focus at this point in time. Uh, the, the outreach that we're looking at first uh, is to first of all uh, reach out and, and get to know parents at the high school for the high school faculty and high school administration. Uh, and then possibly do a World Cafe forum where you invite parents in, you have interpreters available, and you go through a process of communication where everyone has a voice. Uh, the issue of parent surveys, uh, we're gonna look at further. It's certainly more challenging uh, because of the several languages, but we wanna make sure we have us establish some people-to-people -people conversations first before we expand it into a survey form so that parents, uh, out there who may not know how to play the school game will feel more comfortable knowing school personnel, whether it be the administration or faculty, et cetera. So I think that's the approach that we're looking at at this point in time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and we'll continue to report to the school committee uh, on the work happening in our district capacity project code of conduct. Moving on, um, you have heard me uh, talking about for, I want to say the past four years, uh, we talked about park, we talked about park testing, we talked about trial testing, we talked about going from paper and pencil to online testing. Well, what has happened now is our MCAS 2.0, the next generation test, the results will be available, I believe, at midnight tonight. So presently, we have been able to see some of that, but it is embargoed until, as I said, midnight this evening. Uh, and what I want to say, I am going to invite uh, Dr. Ethan Cancel to come up and to share some things that we can share with you at this point, because there is going to be confusion. So parents, since we actually began this testing with the class of 2003, and there was reporting a few years before that, when you talk about our legacy test, MCAS, our MCAS test. So um, we are at a point now where it's a totally different reporting format, totally different way of looking at our students. 
Um, the state has taken a long time for the so-called trial testing, uh, the testing to set the uh, baseline information. Um, and I guess the only thing that I'll say at this point, because I don't want to cross the line and overshare, but what I do want to say is we're going to talk as we go forward about opportunities where when we're giving our usual Dr. Cancel comes, we look at the schools, we talk about student growth percentiles, we talk about achievement levels, we talk about levels of our schools, all of that is changing. One of the things that is not changing um, is the high school remained doing the legacy MCAS test across the state. So what is reported with our high school is the test that they have taken since before 2003, 2003 when it counted. As far as grades three through eight, that is the next generation MCAS test, MCAS 2.0, and it will be totally different. We will take the time not only to educate our own staff, which means our teachers, in understanding the differences, what it means to grow from grade three to grade four, what is a year's progress, which is actually evenly distributed for the first time ever in certainly a test that we have administered uh, in Massachusetts. We will then take the time when we actually do our presentation that we do on camera, we will invite some kind of a forum with an audience to ask questions, whether it's in a subcommittee, but we're going to open it up with dialogue. We'll make sure every one of our principals is here because this is you know, very new to our district. Um, everybody needs to be on the same page. I think we need patience in looking at our students uh, and in setting the baseline for going forward. So I am gonna have Dr. Cancel just go over, and I think you have a couple of slides, Dr. Cancel. Okay. Less than 100. So thank you. I'm very, very happy to be here tonight. This is a, uh, a very exciting time for people in the testing uh, business but it's a very scary time for people in the uh, schools and people who have to explain this stuff. You folks who are gonna have people coming up to you who are very interested in the outcomes, and this is all new. It's, it's all new, it's all different. And the best part was the state has been, uh, I'm not gonna say taking its time because it's been going as fast as they can, but they are just now rolling this stuff out. So it's not as if, over the summer you could have studied up and known what you're talking about. So this is all new. So tonight we are going to uh, talk about something that's very serious with these hilarious um, you know, icons that I stole from the internet. But the next generation MCAS, there are new standards in the state and so there's a new test. By the way, this test is much more rigorous. The reason this test is much more rigorous is because they have new performance levels. And these performance levels, for the first time, signal student readiness for the next grade. And we're gonna talk more about this in detail, so there will be a slide about it, but if you meet the expectations of the fourth grade test, that means you are ready for the fifth grade. You have learned the fourth grade test material. That is new. The other part that's new is at the uh, top end, the high school level, it's now a college and career readiness test, whereas before it happened to be a high school test that fell in 10th grade. It did not say passing the MCAS meant you were college and career ready, it meant that you were able to graduate. If it means now that you have to be college and career ready in 10th grade, that means your 8th grade level has to be higher than it used to be, your 7th grade has to be higher, all the way back down to 3rd grade. It is a different test, it is a tougher test. Because of this, you cannot compare achievement levels to previous years. This is gonna be a trap that a lot of people fall into. These are not comparable tests. Different standards and a different test. So that's a big thing. Don't fall into the trap. We'll talk about it. Um, you know, the research says you need to have multiple exposures to a concept. This is one that's sort of counterintuitive, and so we're gonna hit it several times in this presentation. Just to you know, now confuse you, although you can't compare the achievement levels, student growth is a sort of magical um, measurement, and you technically can compare student growth percentiles from previous years. We'll talk about that, and um, here we go. Legacy, which is sort of a cool term, I think. 
This is the old test, 200 to 280. We're all familiar with it. You had warning failure if you were 200 to 218. If you made 220 to 238, you were in the new needs improvement category. At 240, that was the magic line. 240 and above, you were proficient. By the way, if you were 260 to 280, you were advanced. So that's what it used to be. That's what we're used to. That's what the high school and fifth and eighth grade still is. But next generation, <clears throat> Dan, I'm glad you're here because we can't get that side over. The, uh, the projector sort of cheats the far left. But um, it says 440. I don't know why test makers do this. There's no reason that this couldn't be starting from zero and going up. But for some reason, they decided we'll confuse everyone. We'll start at 440. We'll go to 560. The big deal here is not only are there different terms, but you see now they're 30 point increments. So where warning failure used to be 200 to 220 on an 80 point scale, now you have 30 points between 440 and 470 for not meeting expectations. Partially meeting expectations, meeting expectations, 500 now is the magic line. It used to be 240, it's now 500, but you're going to know after this presentation, they are not the same thing. 240 does not equal 500. 500 is a brand new benchmark. That means you're meeting expectations. And by the way, if you're 530 or higher, um, you're exceeding expectations. That's, that's new language. They are also brand new expectations. I can't say that enough times. These are not the old performance levels. You can't compare them. There are four of them, but they are different. All right. You're going to see this slide again and again and again. Um, proficient, which was that 240, does not mean meeting expectations. So if you have a chart that says, last year my school had 40% of its students in proficient or advanced, and this year you have 35% of your students meeting expectations or exceeding expectations, it does not mean that you went down five percentage points. It simply means that last year you had 40% and on a brand new test in a different scale, this year you have 35%. It'd be as if you um, ran 100 yards and had a certain time, and then the next year you ran 100 meters. You wouldn't say, Oh, you, you went slower running 100 meters. It's a different um, metric. The thing that's really cool about the, this next generation test is it's vertically articulated, which is a really fancy way of saying you can now compare scaled scores. That's all it means. Now, I point this out. That's with the exception of high school because the high school took the old test. It's also with the exception of science, grade five and eight, because they took the legacy test. But the, the English and the math, you can compare across grade levels. So what does that mean in practical terms? Here you are, you have a grade three scaled score, and let's just say it's that magic number of 500. You can say that that score means that you have met the expectations for grade three. In grade six, if you have a 500, that means you've met the expectations for grade six. The state is going to judge schools on this basis. You can now judge across all schools. This has huge accountability implications. In the past, we had percentiles, and that would rank out all the schools in the state. It's not something the state particularly likes. It's not something I like. There are a lot of reasons why we don't like it. But in the past, you could only compare elementary schools to elementary schools, middle schools to middle schools, and the K through eights to K through eights, and the high schools to high schools. With, with high schools aside for now, they will change in the future, but for now they're in a different category. Now all the schools can be compared to each other. That's going to have very, very big implications on the percentile rankings, which may be public. Uh, they are public, but they may be published. So if you see them, the thing is you cannot compare the percentile ranks of this year to past years because last year, if you were 
you know, the, the Hancock Elementary School, you were only compared to other elementary schools. If you were East Middle School, you were only compared to other middle schools. That's all different. Your percentile rank could go up or down, and it has nothing to do with you doing better or worse. It just has to do with you're in a different category, you're in a different league, you're in a different group. So student growth percentile, this is a um, really ingenious measurement. It's what we call test agnostic. It doesn't matter what the test is because it just says, as the student, you have some academic peers. We're going to rank you how you compare to your peers. It doesn't matter if it's MCAS, doesn't matter if it's PARC, it doesn't matter if it's Mrs. Jones's spelling test. It's how you rank according to people who have a similar score history to you. Now, the nice thing about it is you can say, well, in 2015 you did this, and you know, that just is supposed to grab your attention. But the nice thing about it is it lets you compare across years. It also lets you consider where a person starts from. So if you happen to have students who start off at low levels of achievement and they grow over time, that's a very good thing. Straight achievement doesn't capture that. A 500 is a 500 is a 500. What it gives up, though, is it gives up precision. There's always a plus or minus with student growth percentiles. It's, it's an interesting measurement, um, but you really need to say you need to be in a certain range with, with it. Okay, accountability, because you're going to get these questions. For all grades, three through eight schools who administered the uh, next generation MCAS, so that's every elementary school, every middle school, and every K through eight school, there is no accountability status. There, there's an exception if you did not meet the 90% participation rate. This does not apply in Brockton. In Brockton, the kids show up, the kids take their tests. But um, for those districts where that isn't the case, those schools will be level three status. That's not a good thing. Everyone else, there's no accountability status because 2017 is a baseline year. If I can leave you and all the staff, and I try and tell this to June and to Kathy as often as I can, 2017 is a baseline year. The test is not fully, fully ready, developed, mature the way MCAS was. The state did not know how it was going to behave. And that's, that's what happens with a test. That's why you, you take the test and you, you pilot it. You have all these questions that you try out. Over time, it will become a mature test. We'll know how it behaves. We'll, we'll be able to say things. So 2017, the state knew this. They said, we can't compare to last year. We're just going to say, this is a baseline year. No accountability status. Everyone gets a reset. So when people come up to you and say, oh my goodness, my student was a proficient student, and now my student is not meeting expectations or partially meeting expectations. What do I do? What's going to happen? The sky is falling. You say, you know what? This is the baseline year. We're going to do lots to make sure that the kid does well this year, but this is a baseline year. Next year, you'll have two data points. And after two data points, you'll have a much clearer picture of how a school's doing, how a student's doing. So that's a really important point. People are going to be excited one way or another. This is a baseline year. So, by the way, for Dr. Murray and the high school folks, same old, same old. Had the same tests, same old accountability that we used to have. It's regular, you can track how they did compared to the previous years. It's going to change and it's going to change radically, but for this year, um, the accountability is the same old, same old. The entire accountability system is going to change. We don't know what it's going to be, but it is going to change. The Board of Education is going to uh, rule on it. Probably by December, we'll have a better idea. We have the new ESSA um, federal rules that it was uh, our, our version was approved by the feds, and so now the uh, state is going to have to make up the regulations. And so I will tell you more about that going forward, but for now, it's easy. Baseline here, no accountability except for high schools. So 
this is a new test that this is this is a big point when people ask you about it this is a test that ultimately wants to make sure that students are college and career ready so there are rigorous test standards it's different it's harder we were the highest achieving state we had the toughest test with the highest standards we just increased those standards the goal is college ready and career ready so that's the uh, that's my part of it here's some resources there's an MCAS parents page and we'll make sure that you have these um, both just uh, this and also hyperlinks so you can just send it off to people it's available it's on the Department of Ed uh, website the parent page and the parent guide They're they're both pretty good they're gonna say a lot of the things that I said tonight but they're they're helpful and um, we are also going to be out there because this is brand new and as I said the, the state really did not give us a lot of lead time for instance I had no idea what the scale was going to be up until last week and I get a sneak preview so uh, imagine you're a principal you have whatever the 700 kids you have and you find out you know basically this week what the scale is but it's new we'll all learn it is a baseline year so if you have any questions happy to answer them Um, <clears throat> nothing major, just wanted to know uh, if we can get a copy of your presentation in our Friday packets to review. Yep. Um, and that, that was really all I have. Thank you for putting that together. It sounds like, uh, given some of the information wasn't available to you until recently, you probably had to scramble a little bit to be able to put this together for us, so I appreciate your effort. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, one comment slash question. Um, the, you mentioned the, um, I can't remember exactly how you put it, but the use of um, MCAS to determine readiness mm -hmm. for promotion. But we don't use that for promotion. I want to make right. that clear to the folks at home. I know most of the folks sitting out here are teachers. Um, so, I've talked to parents that don't understand that this doesn't. Um, determine promotion um, it just gives us an idea of where the school is really and your student but uh, for us it's really about the school um, but the other thing was uh, 2018 it, I know I've read some some things from the Bessie meetings is 2018 being used as a baseline year I don't remember if that's been determined yet uh, this is the baseline year what they're going to do with I'm, 2018 yeah. we don't know yet okay not sure yet so okay. that'll be a discussion and bright you bring up a very good point because when you talk about readiness for the next grade level we will have to as we've always done I mean I, I have to tell you you know back in 1998 uh, 99 uh, when they were piloting the legacy test and Brockton along with many other uh, urban centers you know I, I can say there were a number of failures and what the state did at that time was they provided all kinds of additional money for support. It was the first time we saw summer programs, a lengthening of the school year by virtue of those students that needed additional assistance. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. I would love to tell you back then it was, you know, a million dollar grant. I was actually the MCAS manager at the time, you know, supporting the district with these additional fundings, after school programs, summer programs. So we continue to look at the needs of students regardless. So if, if a student isn't making a full year progress, which is what you're alluding to, we continue to do what we've always done. You know, look for those tiered interventions or supports and, and we'll continue to certainly look at this more rigorous testing and find ways to make sure our students have opportunities. Yeah. Th that's an excellent point. Thank you for the clarification. It is not a, it is not a grade level requirement that you pass fifth grade to move into sixth grade that you're absolutely right thank you for pointing that out and, and again this is so much information uh, dr. Cancel showed you some websites all of this we will have a bubble you know on our website making sure as we get information 
not only will we provide opportunities for school committee, we'll provide opportunities for our own staff as they have PAC meetings or they have uh, parent-teacher conferences coming up very quickly at our different levels. So this is being sent to us. I, I will give the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education credit. They have spent, I was on two webinars today, one yesterday. You know, everybody is getting their scores and you know, looking at how we message this. But we can't be clear enough to parents is we will do everything we can to make sure that you're informed, but it is a totally different, more rigorous test. Um, and we're pleased to be able to make sure that our, con our children in the Brockton Public Schools, our students, you know, continue to make the progress that they've always made. And we'll work with our teachers. We're, we've been doing that as we've been changing to new standards, uh, continuing to look at ways to resource our district. I think it's critical tonight, having been last Wednesday evening at a forum hosted by Acting uh, Commissioner Jeff Wolfson from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, uh, hosted at a beautiful new uh, Abington Junior Senior uh, High School. And people from all over the region came, educators, parents, um, and it, it certainly is clear, and the next person up will be the Director of Art Technology, Dan Vigent, to talk to all of us about what it's going to take, because not only did we just share with you a new test, it's a new mode of testing. So the new mode of testing is no longer, again, the paper and pencil. It is online, it is computer, and it's not about taking the test the day of the test or the testing. It is making sure that these students have opportunities from the very littlest student that enters our district, that they understand how to maneuver a mouse, how to type, how to express themselves in those ways. Those little kindergartners sitting, sitting in front of us today are going to learn very differently than those 12th graders actually leaving our district in June. So these are things, uh, and again, it's, I, I think, a, 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 a certainly an appropriate time for Director of Technology, Dan Vigian, to come up and to talk about what our district is looking at. And as we make no mistake about it, because we certainly are looking and we're being um, systematic about looking at our equity and education lawsuit. When you've heard me talk about a two and a half override, we are talking about positioning our students to make sure that they have every opportunity that students in the suburbs have, students in other urban districts have, but I'm glad that we're able to see the rigorous testing, the change in the testing, and how quickly we need to resource our youngsters. tonight yep. um, at about how long time wise do you think it'll be before um, you'll have those results ready for distribution to the like, members of the committee well we, we were just talking about that today and I keep <laughs> saying I want more time and Kathy keeps saying it's new tests got to get them out so well, again, we'll get them as quickly as we can obviously they are going to be out there so we will provide, we have information we can certainly provide for you even as early as tomorrow, certainly by Friday. But we want to make sure, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want to just be putting it out there without explanation, which is why I think it's critical for us to, um, tonight you'll hear me recommend, um, we were even talking about, I believe, next Tuesday evening, which yep. is the 24th. It is not a school committee night, but maybe having a subcommittee and possibly asking uh, Cable to support us in, uh, making sure that this information is out there. I would like Dr. Cancel to come back at a different time, probably in November at some point, and do the usual um, presentation that he does, but with all our principals there, open it up to the public, and be able to honestly have some discussion about where we are during this baseline year, and looking at our plans to continue to, to move our, our students forward. Prior to that meeting, just again, we get it. It's new format, new test. But I think I'm, I'm, I imagine I'm not the only one who would like a little bit of time to digest it, so that you can, we can come with, yep. you know, questions that um, are based on having reviewed that, you know, those results ourselves. In other words, we want answers to the questions we're going to get <laughs> before we get them. Yeah, I will tell you this, and again, I want to thank uh, Acting Commissioner Jeff Wolfson. We spoke about this last Wednesday evening. There is a letter from his office, you know, prepared for every parent. We will obviously mimic our own district letter based on a lot of the information that he's sharing. So right away, 
a letter is coming out from the department to parents. There are also answers to frequently asked questions. There are also websites where parents can go to educate themselves. It is confusing enough to us as educators, you know, having been here 41 years, you know, the changes that are happening. I am, thank goodness I have Dr. Cancel. So again, we understand that it is going to be a real shift. We'll certainly uh, make sure you have that information, but we're all learning here at the same time. We understood it was coming. We continue to, to look at our frameworks and the changes that are happening in the classroom. You've heard the dialogue out there. I'm sure it's out there on social media, you know, the Common Core, Park. You know, our state went with MCAS 2.0, the next generation test. We felt it was rigorous. We have faith that we'll continue to lead the nation. There are some very good things about this testing. It is just a change. And this year, it is a reset. It is a baseline year. And, you know, if we have some areas that we're concerned about, that's okay. It allows us to take a step back and see what we need to do to, again, you told, whether it's resourcing our classrooms, whether it's professional development for our teachers, making sure our parents are getting answers to the questions that they have. So, you know, we understand and I believe uh, Desi has been a partner with us and we will be a partner with our parents and certainly our elected officials. Any other questions? Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Cancel. Mayor, I'd like to invite uh, Director of Technology, Dan Vigent, who you and I actually had an opportunity to meet with, uh, I want to say it was over a month ago. Um, this will be a uh, very similar presentation that, again, talks about the changes we have had to make as a district and, and where we're headed from here. And Dan, you also have a PowerPoint, correct? Yes, I do. Okay. So, I'm sorry, Mayor, I was going to signal to you, but <laughs> sorry. It's good exercise. So, um, well, good evening, everybody. Um, so when I hear Superintendent Smith um, talk about new learning techniques with the students, or if I hear Dr. Cancel talking about expanding MCAS, or Director Kelly Jones whispering my ear about talking about adding thousands more uh, students taking the Access ELL test, all I'm actually hearing is we need more devices. So what I'm gonna talk to you tonight about is strictly that is devices and one-to-one, -one, which is one device for every student, which is really what we should be striving to achieve. So uh, when it comes to one-to-one, -one, I've broke it down to three areas. Um, A, what's driving it, because you don't want to buy devices for, for no apparent reason. You want, you want goals and needs, and you want to you accommodate those goals and needs. So what's driving it? The second thing is, how do we get there? And the third thing is, how do we support it, which is sometimes often, um, often not uh, forgotten about, actually, is, is how do you support all those devices and all those students and teachers using those devices? So what's driving it? It's, it's basically the same three things that have been driving it kind of all along is uh, digital curriculum, uh, one of them which is in the form of discovery ed tech books. For example, our entire elementary uh, science curriculum is now online and digital. We do not have textbooks for science. Uh, so digital curriculum is being introduced into the district actually at a rapid pace. Uh, supplemental digital and online curriculum, we have a lot of other programs that aren't necessarily textbook replacement programs, but they're supplemental. Practically every um, curriculum that comes down through, it, through traditional methods are also coming accompanied with digital supplementation um, that we need to provide devices to support. And then digital citizenship. Um, so basically digital, digital citizenship is if you're going to be handing devices uh, to these children, you want to do it in, a, in an appropriate manner. We want to um, provide digital citizenship to the students, how to, how to uh, surf the web appropriately and responsibly, um, make them aware of things like cyberbullying um, and, th and those types of things. And then the large online assessment and testing initiatives, that's really been a big push the last few years. Uh, Dr. Cancel talked about MCAS, uh, Kelly Jones and I have been working together for the last couple of years about the WIDA access for uh, English language learner assessments. Uh, which is a pretty substantial uh, undertaking. 
So how do we get there? Uh, last year, FY17, we committed to a five-year lease, which was a big commitment for us. We've been talking about it for years, uh, literally probably close to seven or eight years we've been talking about a lease. Uh, last year, we did purchase 5,000 student devices through that lease, another 870 teacher devices uh, with that same lease. And then we found additional funding sources. I worked with the business manager very closely through the entire year uh, to get another 3,000 student devices and 600 teacher devices. What's that, what that gives you is a teacher device now for every teacher. So the teachers are now taken care of. Uh, they, they have a device. Every single teacher has a, specifically a laptop um, that, they, that they are assigned to uh, for teaching. And then 8,000 student devices together in FY17 were purchased. Uh, this year, we're looking at hopefully another 1,000 student devices with the current budget situation. Um, if we don't do anything further with, with, with something uh, such as like a second lease. So that's pretty much what I want to talk about. Here is an FY19. Really, we should be looking at a second lease. And that second lease would accommodate the rest of the students. Uh, we would be looking at approximately 7,500 student devices. We would amortize that over five years, like we did with the first lease, and that would cost approximately $600,000 annually. And that would give us a grand total of 16,500 student devices. So between the FY17 purchase, the, F the current year purchase, and then a proposed FY19 lease, we would have what would essentially become a one-to-one -one environment for our schools. Um, if you're looking at 16.5 and saying uh, we heard 17,000 students district-wide, a lot of the pre-K and kindergarten, we subsidize them with um, iPads and other types of devices that we found work better with those age groups and certain applications that the curriculum department heads want to run. So that's where you'd find the other 500 devices would probably be miscellaneous devices such as, the, such as those. So, like I mentioned, so we're, we're buying a lot of devices. Um, you know, basically, if you add it up last year, we bought 10,000 devices. We typically buy somewhere around 1,000 and 1,500 devices a year. And last, last year, we did 10,000. So that was a, a significant lift for my department to deploy and now to support. Uh, and just to put that in some kind of perspective, I dug back through some of my presentations going back, you know, five or six years ago. And in FY13, I looked, and we had about 7,000 student and staff devices. So that's total devices. And we had 13 support staff. That's in my department. Uh, and that's including the secretary, secretary, just to put things in perspective. And that gives you a ratio of about a one tech support person, whether it be a technician, a network admin, a secretary, myself, uh, for every 538 devices. And, that's, and, when, and when I say devices, that's laptops and desktops, basically. I'm not including uh, audio video, which has been a, a significant implementation on its own. Um, if you look at our district, and we have roughly 1,000 classrooms, we've put in interactive projectors, boards, uh, document cameras, in just about every single one of those classrooms. And my department's supporting that as well. Um, FY18, the, the current year, we have roughly 15,000 student and staff devices. So we've more than doubled the amount of devices and we have 15 support staff. So we basically doubled the size of the district and added two people to support that. Uh, that gives us a current ratio, including the secretary. I don't mean to keep harping on that, but I'm trying to put in perspective. It's an all hands on deck mode uh, that we're in. And even with that, we're at one to a thousand uh, devices per technical support person, which is, is beyond reasonable. Um, expectations of, of supporting this adequately for the teachers and the students. Uh, FY19, if we do go forward with the lease, uh, that 15,000 becomes 19,000, and that math's a little funny, you might think, but what happens is as we add that other 7,500, we also cull the lot of the existing equipment because to actually even get up to, say, FY13, that 7,000 mark, what we did was we stopped retiring devices. So. If you look to the right, real quick, um, one of the things is a 2010 to 2015 uh, DESE tech plan guideline. This is right from Mass, uh, mass.us, DOE's website, and that's their guidelines. And if you notice, the second bullet's a five-year life cycle, and that's what kind of we've always strived for, but the reality was 
we cut out the life cycle completely just to keep our numbers up so we have the availability even though it wasn't really what you would call adequate or ideal at least it was something in there so when we bring on new devices and we try to maintain a five uh, five year life cycle even though we're bringing on 7,500, the reality is we'll probably retire. As those 7,500 are coming in, we're probably going to retire 3,000 going out automatically because those devices really should have been retired probably three years ago. Um, so that's, that's how that math works if you look back at it and start adding things up. Um, but the reality is we, we should be probably somewhere around 19,000 student and staff devices um, district-wide, and that would give us really a one-to-one -one environment for our staff and for our students. And when, you know, with all the programs and all the curriculum department heads, I mean, they could all come up and talk, to, talk about it. The number one request I always get now is, we need more devices. Even though we gave them 10,000 last year, which was the biggest purchase we probably have ever made, their response was, this was great. We already figured out how to use these. We need the rest. So the, their demand, you know, we're not pushing them just to say, oh, we're a one-to-one -one district. This demand and, and why I'm here today is because that's what I'm hearing from the schools. I mean, I got to advocate for technology as a technology director by default, but honestly talk to any principal or department head and they'll be the bigger advocates for technology. They're the ones that are saying they need this. Um, so that's, that's pretty much in a nutshell. Like I said, you know, my department does a lot of things. There's a vast complex array of support and services that we provide, uh, but I didn't really want to get lost in the minutiae of that. Specifically, the one-to-one -one and device availability is what we really need to target. It's really what's going to help propel Brockton into that 21st century learning environment instead of just kind of making do with what, what we've had. And let's see, one more. So I, I gave you a handout because I knew it wasn't going to show up on the screen very well. I gave you a handout. This was an actual uh, lease proposal that I submitted to the superintendent. It pretty much the narrative that you see up top basically says exactly what I just said and went through with the presentation. The bullets are just some pros and cons of a one-to-one -one versus a one-to-many environment. And a one-to-one -one is obviously a device for every student. A one-to-many, which is what we have now, could be one device is now shared between five or six <laughs> students. And there's a lot of advantages and disadvantages to that environment for the technical and just logistical aspects of maintaining a one-to-many. There's a lot of disadvantages at the technical level from a department as well as at the school level. Because when, when you have a device and there's really no ownership of that device, it's very difficult to manage that device. Technically, but also logistically for the schools. That device is being shared amongst multiple teachers, multiple students, where is it at any given point of day. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to get a handle on in a one-to-many environment. So going to a one-to-one, -one, even though it'll be more devices, it'll actually be easier for the schools to manage and easier for my department to support. Now, I'm not going to say my department is going to support 19,000 devices with 15 people. It's not going to be that easy, but it, it would actually improve the environment just going to a one-to-one, -one, just getting that level. Hey, Dan. Hey. Thanks for your presentation. Sure. Um, a comment and a question. The comment is um, I've worked with you in the Access yes. Center. You do yeah. a great job. Uh, finding grants and finding different ways to save money and uh, pillaging devices or hoarding them, I've noticed. Um, and going through the schools, it's great to see that each classroom has its own projector that's a attached to the wall and the smart boards, and that's something that not all, every district has. Um, I don't have it in mine. Um, I didn't install my own projector. <laughs> um, but my question is, what, what's the advantage of leasing versus buying? So the advantage of leasing versus buying, the actual cost of the device doesn't change. You're really just spreading out how you're paying. Okay. So do you want to pay basically three? So a lease of that size was roughly around $3 million, and that's a pretty accurate number, give or take. Um, so it's, do you want to pay $3 million this year, or do you want to pay 600000 every year? And then it's basically perpetual because at the end of the five years, it's not like we're doing a three-year amortization for a five-year life cycle. We're doing a five-year amortization for a five-year life right. cycle. So at the end of the fifth year, nothing changes. You just refresh those devices, and that annual payment maintains throughout, you know, perpetually, basically. But there's really no cost advantage mm -hmm. one way or the other. 
A minor cost advantage, I'd say, would be interest rates. But in today's interest rate environment, if you will, uh, I think this that last you know, last year's lease, I think, was like 1.4 percent or something like that. It was pretty negligible to a certain extent, considering okay. the size. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Mentioned with the increased amount of devices, obviously you wouldn't, 15 people wouldn't be enough to support that number of devices. How many uh, more people do you feel you'd need in your department in order to properly so support it? So the state would say 400, uh, one support person for every 400. That's their most recent um, mm -hmm. projection. And FY 12 or 11, I looked back at that report, they were saying one for every 200 devices. So obviously they even realized there was no way we were going to get to one to 200. They bumped it to one to 400, and, but Brockton still is saying that's not even achievable. So what I would say is in FY13, I can honestly tell you that if I got two or three complaints a year about my department, I would be surprised. In FY18, they're not complaints about my staff specifically, but they're complaints about how quickly can we, can we um, react to issues? Uh, how much professional development can we really supply with the amount of devices and the amount of programs that are expanding? Can we really provide? So, and that, that's every week now. So one to two to th maybe three comments like that in FY13 has turned into every week I'm hearing it. So what I would say is if you use that, one to 538 while stretching it, and it was even beyond what the state's recommendations was, which I still thought that was pretty, pretty um, conservative, if you will. Uh, we, were, we were getting by, we were managing, and we had a pretty good success, success rate, quality of service, if you will, service level agreements, mm -hmm. uh, those kind of things. We were actually able to accommodate that at a pretty reasonable level. Um, like I said, FY18, we, we basically doubled that, and that's real, that's today. We're at one to 1,000, and I'm probably getting complaints weekly, if not every other day. And they're not, they're not, they're, they're pleasant, they're cordial complaints, <laughs> and I agree with the complaints. And I, I don't even know if really calling them complaints, but they're making me aware of the needs, and those needs are growing, and the needs are, um, you know, we don't have enough people supporting the weight of all the infrastructure and all the devices that we gave them. And then on top of that, we're expanding every, every program you're talking about is coming down, whether it's um, ELL assessment, MCAS testing, digital curriculum, it's, it's all online. So it's, everything has to do with getting a device and getting them used to it. All right, I think I asked because let's say that we did go forward with something like this. You know, I, I think it would make sense to also part of the conversation and part of the financial numbers needs to be the additional support staff, because to your point, great, we bring in all these additional devices, but we don't have the bodies to support them. So, you know, it's just, it's gonna be counterproductive. I think, you know, if you were gonna present this for real consideration, I'd wanna see a number to show, all right, what do you need in staff so that we can factor that in when we're making decisions about it? Okay, I can, I can do a supplemental on, on specific staff needs. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. As I said, when we were uh, in Abington last Wednesday evening, it was interesting to have the acting commissioner talk about, and he said, a five-year plan for districts to get on board with one-to-one -one devices. He didn't even like saying that. He wants it much shorter than five years. I think they're looking at some districts that are struggling. Last year, we made the decision, and it was a struggle, to look at our eighth grade classes at the time and we had had a rollout school by school. And when they said to us last year, all eighth grade students should be tested online and you could get a waiver under certain circumstances, and I'm glad we didn't even request the waiver. We had conversation, but we wanted to make sure those eighth graders had a chance to look at that test online. So by the time they become, they're now your ninth graders at Brockton High. But that being said, the state is moving forward you know, this is a critical need. You know, the mayor, myself, Jay Condon, uh, and Aldo Petronio met with Dan about a month ago. And when you hear us talking as a district, looking at ways, and, and it might be all about, you know, we're not backing down from what we feel our children need with equity, you know, but also in looking at how we, as a poor city, are able to support this. But the one thing that we have always done is we have come together for our children. 
we've made sure that our children get what they need so that they can get accepted to the colleges they get accepted to. You know, that you have the graduation rate that you have and the dropout rate that's low and alternative pathways that also our kids are succeeding at and go on to college and career. That's what every one of us wants. So this is a critical area right now. Uh, as I said, the mayor and I are having conversations about it and obviously with our school committee and our city council. You know, we are going to figure out a way and Dan is correct. I have had teachers come up to me. Um, you know, they're, they're teaching and you know, it is part of their day-to-day -day teaching process to be using not only the instructional support, but the conversation about the one-to-one -one devices. When we have these laptop carts and they come into a classroom and they're passed out to the students and all of a sudden the passwords don't work because somebody else might have had it last time and then it becomes intervention from a technology department that is short-staffed to say the least. So we have got to come and be, live within our so-called pocketbook, but we cannot uh, compromise our children's future. And whether that is a, a discussion, um, you know, going forward, um, you've heard me talk about, you know, looking at ways that we as a city support our youngsters. So it's very real, it's up there, and these are the conversations that we'll continue to have while we're balancing everything else we're trying to bring to our students. We all set? Very good. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Dan, thank you very much. I just want to make note, I am going to bring uh, Kelly Jones up here, the director of our bilingual department. And when we last left you, we were waiting for our kindergartners to come in. Uh, we have gone out there, and we are in the process of hiring the additional teachers that we needed for compliance uh, with our coordinated program review at one of our alternative sites. We looked at a large number at North Middle School in one of our very largest classrooms in the district. We're in the process of hiring there. Uh, we recommended the powers for not only our kindergarten classes uh, and also some of our bilingual kindergarten classes. I asked Kelly to come in and to sit down with me and to take a look district-wide because not only are we looking at numbers throughout the summer and looking at our classes throughout the district, but we also are looking at a year ago what were the additional students during the school year that came in to populate you know, some of our programs. So when I left Kelly yesterday, and we will talk about this when we have an opportunity to meet in a recommended finance subcommittee meeting, I'm looking to recommend for this Tuesday evening, we will now talk about some of the supports that we need in our classes throughout the district. So Kelly, would you like to share what we talked about last evening? Sure. Um, so, Brockton being a transient population, it's very hard to gauge where we are today and where we were going to be in May. Um, we've always had the, uh, the flexibility to begin the classes with a lower level of students because we know students arrive in September and October and November and December all the way through the next school year. Um, so in order to try to plan, even though there's no guarantee that this population that we will get throughout the school year will mirror what we did last year, I was able to go through and I looked at who arrived in our school last year between September 2017 and March of 2018. We didn't even factor in those who came in in April, May, and June because we get kids who come in the second to the last week of the school year. Um, and so what we found is that on, on, on average, some of those classes get four, five, six, seven kids in a particular classroom through that, throughout the year. Um, so when we look at um, class sizes that are already at 28, 29, 30, we have a, a few class sizes over 30. And remember, the self-contained SEI classrooms are the students who are at the fo foundational levels of English. They are at WIDA's level one and two. And we also have some low threes that are, are recommended by the language assessment team to continue in that foundational level. We're able to provide both the content and the mandated hours of ESL services through this model. But we're beginning the school year with very large class sizes, as well as a number of splits. Complicating this is also the fact that we do not know what 
uh, population we will be getting from Puerto Rico. Um, we do not have a, a, a large community here um, in terms of relative to our Cape Verdean population, our Brazilian population, our um, Haitian population. But we do have a few hundred students um, who, who are currently English learners who, who do come from Puerto Rico. And we have a kind of a historic community in Brockton of students who are second or third generation migrants from Puerto Rico. So, so we, we have to monitor not only the existing class sizes and, and who are coming into them across the board, but we have to pay extra special um, attention to those students who may be coming in from Puerto Rico and staying with extended family, cousins, um, you know, second cousins, and, and their, not only their academic needs, but their social emotional needs. So, so you know, Superintendent Smith, do you, sh should, we, should we talk about what are some of our ideas, or? Yes, I'm but I would like Kelly, we've got her here with us, and I do want to talk about some of the areas that we're seeing okay. as areas of concern, just to put it out there to you. We continue to study this, um, and as I said, I'm working very closely with uh, our chief budget officer who is monitoring when you talk about, you know, additional funding. Some of it is, frankly, people that are getting jobs, people that are off of unemployment. But we're trying to be very strategic, and that's why I wanted Kelly, I think we've done this. I think we looked at kindergarten that came in, the needs and the phone calls you were getting. And it's, it's a shame when we look at where we were three or four years ago, because we had a grant that supplied a paraprofessional in every one of our kindergarten classes. And our classes were a little more reasonable than they are right now. Mm -hmm. So it is very difficult for teachers that are working with, and, and again, when I look at what you've done to support kindergarten, we looked at the kindergarten age. That's coming down the line. We're looking at, you know, we're doing a lot of things to look at how we're supporting youngsters uh, strategically in a way that makes sense. So I am going to ask Kelly to share with you some of the problem areas that we're seeing. Um, you know, I'm working closely with June Saber McGuire and her team to also look at, uh, and I'll tell you just quite honestly, one of the discussions was when we look at, and I'm going to use this as an example, the Kennedy School has a Haitian strand, as does the Baker School for elementary. We were seeing, and, and you know, when you say smaller class sizes, I look at the Kennedy classes, that's where they should be. Mm -hmm. But they happen to be smaller than maybe some of the classes at the Baker School. Is there a way, because not, not, the children don't always live in the Baker or the Kennedy area, they're being bussed in or vanned in. Is there a way, if we were working with parents and saying we have smaller class sizes here, could we send a number of students if we felt the numbers mm -hmm. were stable? But we're also looking at, as Kelly told you, additional students coming in. I doubt it would be in that strand. You know, we're looking at where we were last mm -hmm. year, and we anticipate some additional students throughout the year. Certainly no major catastrophes at this point in yeah. Haiti, which would really impact you know, some of our projections. But we are looking, and I want you to hear that, that we're looking across the board at ways to kind of stabilize the class sizes. So some of the larger sizes yeah. that okay, we've seen. Okay, sure. Share that? So if, if we kind of go, I'll, I'll just highlight a number of them. Um, so at the Angelo, for example, uh, we have a 4-5 split. Um, historically, the Angelo um, had lower numbers. It's not really the case anymore. We have our third grade with 29 students and the 4-5 split with 33 students. So this teacher uh, is, is responsible for, for delivering grade level content standards for fourth and fifth grade, as well as the ESL that's appropriate for their proficiency level. In 2017, tw between September 2016 to March 2017, there were a f four additional um, students who came in grade four, four additional students who came in grade five. Now again, we can't guarantee that we'll get these students again, but if, it, if it's a pattern and if we're getting comparable numbers of students, that would raise the students uh, to over you know, 40 kids in a split class, and that's just un, un, untenable. Um, so, so one of the things that, that, I, that, that we're, we're looking into is if we can uh, bring back an additional teacher to uh, the Angelo, eliminate that split, 
And that would also address potentially some of those students who enter into the Raymond School throughout the school year. The Raymond School numbers are very, very high. Um, and again, this is this, this data changes day by day, so I'm looking at the data from end of September. Um, Raymond Kindergarten 30, Raymond Grade 127, Grade 227, Grade 330, Grade 427, uh, Grade uh, 534. And that's before we have students who are coming in throughout the school year. Um, and again, these are the students at those foundational levels that really need um, very targeted instruction, not only in their English language development, but in their content instruction in English as well. So, so if we were able to, to add another teacher, that would uh, allow us to potentially um, kind of get some of those, those upper grade students who might have been placed at the, uh, at the uh, Raymond over to the Angelo because there, there would be some, some kind of a buffer for incoming students throughout the school year. We have another, um, at, over at the Baker, we have a, uh, a classroom, um, kindergarten has 32, grade two has 32. We also have a four five split that has 23 students in there. Again, they're having, the teacher is having to manage two curricula grade level curricula as well as English language development needs. So if there is a way that we were able to get an additional paraprofessional to support, oh no, this is where we're thinking about um, busing and trying to take some of those students because the Kennedy numbers are lower. So if there's an opportunity to, to remove some of the students in grade K and two and transport them over to the Kennedy where the numbers are really manageable, that would satisfy um, those those students. Um, if I look at the at the the previous years, you know, we had um, five kids come in in kindergarten at the Baker, three kids came in in grade one, two, three, an additional three in that split. So so this is something that we're going to have to monitor, even if we have a short term solution for those particular um, grade levels. Brookfield numbers are high. Um, grade two is 29, grade three is 28. Uh, there are two grade fours over there. They're both at 24, uh, 25 and 26. Grade five is at 32. And if there was an opportunity to bring back uh, some additional paraprofessional help for those classrooms, that would really um, assist the teachers and to be able to meet the diverse needs of those students. We have um, over at the Davis, um, a four five split. We have um, a, a, a kindergarten class of 31. Um, we have a second grade class of 28, and we have another four or five split of 26 students. And if there's an opportunity to get addition, additional paraprofessional for that building as well. Um, at the George, um, at our, at our uh, kindergarten level, we're already at 31. Now, now the George, is our, our sole SEI program for Spanish-speaking students. So, so there's a potential that we could have a real increase here. We don't know yet. Um, we have 30 in the, the uh, kindergarten class, and we have an additional 20 in a one-two split class. Grade one, 25. Uh, grade three, 27. And four and five is a bit lower, so if we get students who are coming from Puerto Rico in those upper grades, we have some opportunities there to support them um, in the program. Um, and if we were able to get an additional paraprofessional for that building, um, that would really support particularly that kindergarten class that has um, 30 students. And in um, last year, we had an additional one which had brought them up to 31. Over at um, the Kennedy, we do have a, a pretty reasonable numbers right now, um, but, for, uh, but we have students who are coming throughout the school year and potentially busting some students over. Over at the Davis, we do have, uh, at the Kennedy, we do have a four five split. Right now, there are 20 students in that four five split. And at the Raymond, the Raymond numbers are just at its capacity. Um, 
kindergarten 30, grade 1, 27, grade 2, 27, grade 3, 30, grade 4, 27, grade 5, 34. And again, this is in October. Um, in, in the Raymond School last year in grade 4, a five, we had seven students who arrived between September and March. If, if we got a similar number of students, we'd be at 41 in that classroom. Um, so so uh, there's no way to guarantee that we will have a comparable students who are coming in. Some years we, we get a ton of second graders, and some years we might have, last year we had a lot of four fives. So, so while it is, it is um, hard to, to gauge where we are going to be throughout the school year. Um, the fact that we're starting off the school year with such numbers is, is, is going to need to be monitored and supported as possible. If we were able to get an additional um, paraprofessional for that building, that would be really um, helpful in those SCI classrooms with such large numbers. Helpful. We'll continue the dialogue on Tuesday evening. It'll be my recommendation, but we are looking at a teacher at the Angelo. We're looking at at least three paras to support our SEI classes. We're looking at the possibility of uh, look, working with families if we can move some students over to the Kennedy. That might make sense location-wise. Um, if we're able to obviously provide transportation, as, and as Kelly tells us, we're going to have to be looking at this all year long. So we will continue to keep this chart. We'll keep you uh, updated mm -hmm. um, in all our classes. But this is, we talked about being strategic. That is exactly what we've done to open school. Um, and uh, we will certainly deal with this impact. So we'll have some of this information in your packet in preparation for Tuesday evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, very helpful. And to finish up this evening, uh, items to refer to uh, subcommittee. We did talk about a safety, security, and transportation subcommittee. We had the presentation last school committee about distracted driving and a public service announcement that was prepared by students. We had talked at one point uh, about the possibility of, we had a young student come and talk about bullying. We also had, um, I believe, one of our police officers, uh, Nicole Anderson, has been looking to do, um, she's one of our school resource officers, looking to do social media pitfalls and presenting to our middle school students. Um, and we're, so these are things we'd like to also look at under that subcommittee. And I believe we're also looking at uh, the possible, well, not the possibility, our contract ends this year for transportation. You will be renegotiating a new contract with whoever the vendor is. But um, that is all going to be something that we could at least start that dialogue. So that'll be one recommendation. Uh, also, uh, for the subcommittee, we just talked about a finance subcommittee. I know Aldo Petronio is preparing to tell you that we will be starting the FY19 budget. I know nobody <coughs> wants to hear this, but we'll be starting it in November and making projections. So we can take a look at where we are and where we think we're going to be. Obviously, that is subject to change. So we'll also present that, um, talk about it at our subcommittee meeting. I know he's planning that for early November. Um, I think our first school committee meeting is set for the 8th of November, the day after the election. And the last one is the um, superintendent uh, contract and evaluation. I know you're working on that. We have to get a rating into the state. Um, and Mr. Minicello as vice chair, I know is heading that up. And the other thing uh, that I will mention to close is uh, Jeff Wolfson, acting commissioner, called Al Brockton the other evening. And one of the things he talked about was this is the 25th year coming up of ed reform. So the grand bargain, you know, ed reform, the McDuffie case, and, and he talked about that very publicly while in Abington. They're going to be celebrating all of the achievements, and it's called Leading the Nation. So Desi is coming out with their own campaign a little bit different than Brockton Kids Count. You know, theirs is leading the nation. Um, I think it's apropos that they come and they ask to be invited to Brockton with some type of, I'm not sure exactly what it will be. There's going to be something at the State House, you know, to talk about the achievements and what has happened with the turnaround in our own state. I think it's just perfect to have Brockton a part of this initiative as we work with the state to make sure that truly our children are supported the way they need to be supported. Perhaps so we that, could review with them the findings of their own commission. 
regarding Chapter 70 I, funding. I wasn't going to say that on yeah. camera, but I have all <laughs> kinds of ideas of what okay. we could do with that yeah. unveiling yeah. and kickoff of uh, 25 years. We can explain to them how the formula is now broken. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not sure we're going to invite you, Mayor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's after the, the election. Party, yeah. right. <laughs> anyway, that is my report for the All evening. All right, so the, the two subcommittees wanted where Mr. Minichello will coordinate with Mr. Minichello for the dates. Okay. All right. So how about uh, new business? Anything under new business? Boy, we missed Tom on that one, huh? All right. Barring any new business, I'll entertain a motion. Motion adjourned. Made properly seconded. All in favor? Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.